week three of our series, Holy Spirit. We've been working to build anticipation, desire, expectancy of the Spirit coming. Like, that's where we're going. That's what this is about. Now, to dive into today, today is a big day, but it all starts with maybe just a little bit of a story. I've done a fair amount of premarital counseling. Uh, I've been through it myself, actually. (laughs) And one of the things that I've noticed is when we talk about premarital counseling, we talk about the reality that you have to get ready for marriage, right? That's the whole reason we do it, get ready for marriage. Now, when I went through my premarital counseling, and maybe you had a different experience, but ours was was pretty good. I had a good relationship with the person. And so, um, you know, I thought this is going to be everything that we need. Well, how many of you know that premarital counseling, like, scratches the surface of what you're going to experience in marriage? Right? You're like, hey, wait a second. This, we talked about this in premarital counseling. You're not sticking to the plan. Right? That's because you don't stick to the plan in marriage. You make it up as you go. The only thing that could actually prepare us for marriage is marriage itself. Like, being immersed into the thing is very different than learning about the thing. Which kind of goes back for the last month and a half of what we've been talking about. The reality that knowing about God is different than experiencing God, is it not? Being immersed into an experience is entirely different than learning about it. Now, there was another moment uh, that this kind of happened in our lives. I'll tell you what, before we had kids, I was a better parent. Anybody feeling that? Yeah, I knew so much about parenting before I had kids. Then I had the kids and I thought, this is different. Nobody told me I'd be catching things in my hand that I never thought I'd be catching in my hand before in the middle of the night. And when people say they sleep like babies, I think, did you poop your pants? And did you wake up every other hour? Because that's how babies sleep. (laughs) Right? The only thing that prepared me for parenting was parenting. I had to be thrown into the deep end. And once you get there, you you feel like you're just making it up as you go along because you're acclimating to this new temperature of life, right? That's what happens in an immersive experience. There is no substitution for being immersed into a situation. And we've known this actually with uh, different theories of learning, especially around language. Immersion is king. You can do some prep work for learning about a a new culture, or you can learn uh, some of the information about linguistics, and you can practice, you can use all sorts of apps and go through uh, whatever you want to go through in order to learn a new language. But there is the necessary step of being immersed into a culture in order to really, truly gain the nuances and all of that. Why? Because culture is a powerful thing. Being immersed into a thing changes us radically. It's significantly different. It's significantly different than learning about something, having knowledge about something, but also it's significant because it does change what we do. Case in point, there was uh, uh, some observations going on with communities of chimpanzees. Did you know that's what a group of chimpanzees is called? A community? That's cool. That's That's a bonus. Doesn't really relate to this. So... Uh, They were watching these communities of chimpanzees and they were doing some study on cultural nuances and how different animals within the community might adapt and change. And they noticed uh, as they were watching two different communities of chimpanzees, researchers noticed something different about those communities. And it was how they gathered their food. They used tools. Each community of chimpanzees had tools that they used for eating. And one of the communities used a stick as a spoon, okay? And another community used a leaf as a spoon. Small and subtle difference, right? Not something you would think would be overly significant between the two communities, but here's the power of culture. They noted that one chimpanzee from the leaf community uh, started joining into the stick community. And, you know, they're not necessarily talking and teaching each other about, hey, here's what we do. Hey, welcome to the community. Like, we're going to, uh, I've, I've noticed you used a, a leaf. It's a little bit awkward because we use sticks here. But, um, 
you know, there's, there's not that forefront communication happening with the chimpanzees. But there is a cultural power. There is an immersive experience that this chimpanzee had as he left one community and joined another. And what happened is that without being instructed to do so, the only tool this chimpanzee had ever known in his life for gathering food was now shifting, and he dropped the leaf, and he picked up a stick. Now, that might seem subtle to us, but that's a massive change. That's something that that chimpanzee grew up doing. That's the power. Uh, that's the power of immersion in a culture. That's the transformative thing. It, it changes from being a, a leaf gathering tool to a stick tool. There's something in here for us as well. That as we are pursuing God, there is a point in time when the Lord says, hey, you've known about me, you've heard about me, now it's time to be immersed in my culture. It's time to be immersed in who I am. I think there's something for the church in America today. We've, we've been talking about this, but to keep it in the forefront of our minds, we are so obsessed with knowledge, and here's why I think that is. We're obsessed with knowledge that we think we have it, have it um, figured out, and we're obsessed with knowledge because the more we know, the more we think we can control. That if I can know enough about something, I can control that thing. I have control over it. Nothing can surprise me because I know about it, right? Knowing about something is not the same as being immersed into it. And friends, the church in America has deficient in experience and plentiful in knowledge. We want to change that. And that's what we've been setting up. That's what we've been building up to is today and the rest of this year because the Lord has an immersive experience for us. If we'll slow down and take a look. I want to invite you to turn with me to Luke chapter 3. We're going to be bopping around the Bible. I don't know if that's the right word. Bopping around the Bible a little bit. And, uh, and so we're going to start just in Luke chapter 3, verse 15. Now, Luke has had a little bit of, of stuff going on. If you look back, you know, there's the Luke's account of Jesus' life. Uh, it goes back and, and looks at some of the history, looks at Jesus' history, his birth, and all of that. And then there's this kind of coming-of-age moment for Jesus. It's about 30 years old that, that a, a Jewish male would enter into kind of the family call, right? And so there was this point in time at which this, this had happened. And Luke has been giving us Jesus' background up until this point. Now there's this point in time where Jesus is about to step into the family ministry, but it's not, it's not Joseph who was perceived to be the father of Jesus, not his family business. It was his heavenly father's business, right? So... We, uh, we uh, come into the scene, and we have John the baptizer baptizing people, and we pick up in verse 15. The people were waiting expectantly and were wondering in their hearts if John might possibly be the Messiah. John answered them all, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I, uh, than I will come, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Let me read that again. The people were waiting expectantly and were wondering in their hearts if John might possibly be the Messiah. John answered them all, I baptize you with water. I'm immersing you in this water. I'm just using water. But one who is more powerful than I will come. The straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. I'm not worthy to be his servant. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. So we have the Pharisees who have been watching John the Baptist. John was a little bit of a madman. You can go back and read a story. Each of the Gospels um, account for him in some sort of way. He is a significant figure. He's drawing crowds out at the Jordan River, and people are being baptized. Now, baptism was an immersive experience. It, it literally meant to, dump, uh, to dip something or someone in water. 
and then they would be raised back out of it. And, and the primary purpose of this was ceremonial at first. On the, on the surface, it was a ceremonial cleansing. It was uh, symbolic of being clean because, you know, you could dip somebody in a river. They're not actually clean, right? So it was symbolic. That was one way that it was used. And so John was baptizing people out in the Jordan River, and he's uh, symbolically declaring them as clean in a way that they weren't before. Now, this is significant because John was baptizing, uh, was baptizing people in an understanding of repentance, meaning a change of heart. That while being the family of God, they didn't always act in line with their father. And so they were being baptized in repenting, changing their direction of saying, I'm going to live now differently than I did before. But there's another understanding around uh, baptism, this immersion in the water as well, in that the Jewish population eventually started using it as a way to signify people who were converting to Judaism from being a Gentile, from outside of the family of God, inside the family of God. And so they would be immersed. It was a radical difference in who they were. You were going this direction, and now you're going this direction because you've been You've been immersed. Not that water has the power to do that, but water symbolizes the thing in itself. So as people are coming out to John the Baptist, they're seeing what he's doing, the crowds are coming out, and it starts to pique the curiosity of the religious leaders and the Pharisees. And so they start sending, they start sending uh, some representatives out to John the Baptist to ask him all sorts of questions. They want to investigate who he is and what he's doing because they want to make sure that they have control. Again, it's that knowledge gives us the perception of control, right? The Pharisees were after an understanding about what John was doing. And so they ask him, are you the Messiah? Is this who you're claiming to be? And John's simple answer is, you know what? I'm just out here baptizing with water. I'm immersing people into water. I'm just using water. But the one you're looking for, that one, that one's entirely different. What I immerse you into right now is just symbolism. There's a different immersion. There's a different immersive experience that the one you're asking about is going to bring. It will be substantially, significantly different than water that I'm using. It is like spirit and fire. Spirit and fire. He's going to baptize you in something entirely different. The experience will not be uh, just transformative. It is going to be radically transformative. Not just in water, but in the spirit and fire. But when would this happen? The people heard it. They're waiting for it. When would that sort of thing happen? Well, if we continue on... Looking at the story of how this all played out, it doesn't seem like they caught what John was saying. If we move on in our passage, we go to John 4, 1 and 2. John chapter 4, 1 and 2 says this. Now Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. Although, in fact, it was not Jesus who was baptized, who baptized, but his disciples. Now, the Pharisees continued to pay attention to Jesus. They had been paying attention to John. John the Baptist starts looking at Jesus. He says, there's one who's coming after me. Uh, he's so far above me in significance and importance. I'm not even worthy to be his servant. That's how important he is. He is the coming one. He's the Messiah. In the book of John earlier... Uh, John says, you know what, I didn't know who he was going to be, but I knew that the Spirit was going to descend on someone. And that person that the Spirit descended on and stayed, he was the Messiah. And then he looks at Jesus, he points him out to his disciples, and he says, behold the Lamb of God who's come to take away the sins of the world. This is the one who will baptize in the Spirit. And so the Pharisees now start paying attention to Jesus as well. They start noticing that Jesus is gaining crowds. That he is amassing a following. 
And they start to get a little bit jealous, in fact. Uh, Jesus here overhears, he, he learns through the grapevine, I heard that you heard that so-and-so said, right? That sort of a thing. He hears that the Pharisees are concerned that his group is baptizing and gaining more disciples. Now that's significant. It's significant because there was something already stated about Jesus and how he would baptize. And so there's an author's note that the apostle, the disciple John, puts in here. This is not John the Baptist who writes this. This is one of John who was one of the twelve. He writes this little author's note in verse 2. Although, in fact, it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. You see, what author John is interested in is preserving what he's already stated about what the Messiah would do in terms of baptism. It echoes what the other gospel writers have said about what the Messiah would do in John the Baptizer's words. That when this Messiah comes, he's going to baptize in spirit and in fire. Now the Pharisees are watching and they're saying, okay, but that doesn't make sense to us. So we're seeing you baptize more people. Now we're getting concerned about that. You're, you're gathering a following. We're concerned we're going to lose our importance. But John the author writes, you know what? It wasn't actually Jesus who baptized. It was his disciples who baptized. Jesus never baptized anyone. And the story continues. So when does Jesus baptize? When does this spirit and fire event take place? It takes place in Acts chapter 2. If we read the first four verses of Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. What we have right here is Jesus' first baptism. It's an immersive experience. There's no water present. Now, one of Jesus' later followers, Luke, is a doctor. He's a, a little bit of a, a he's a little bit of a an author in terms of recording the history. He's exact in his writing. He wrote the gospel according to Luke, and then this is the second volume in his work the acts of the disciples, and he's describing this significant experience. He says, when this day of Pentecost came, a Jewish celebration, they were all together in one place. Who was all together in one place? Well, we find out in a little while, it's about 120 of Jesus's followers, 120 followers who took seriously some commands from Jesus. You see, in Matthew 28, we see Jesus telling his disciples, that you're going to go into all the world. He's commissions his followers to go into all the world, making disciples and baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And then in Acts, we, in Acts chapter 1, we see Jesus again before he ascends say one more thing to them. Go, but wait. That's what we talked about last week. Go into all the world and make disciples, but wait until you receive power from on high. And then you will be empowered to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. There is this thing that's happening. They've been commissioned, and they've been commanded to go do some stuff. But there's an empowerment that they haven't received that's vital to the mission. Now, it's quite possible that... There were more of Jesus' followers, more than 120, who heard this commission, and they decided to just start going and doing what they heard Jesus say to do. And we would consider that obedient. But there's about 120 who heard Jesus' second command to go and wait. Wait in Jerusalem. Wait for the power that comes from on high. There is an immersive experience coming, and you're going to need that in order to be empowered to be my witnesses. It's been prophesied. We looked at it in week one just a couple weeks ago, the beginning of the month. We looked at this expectation that in uh, Joel chapter 2, Joel the prophet says, In those days I will pour my spirit out. And Jesus says, You go to Jerusalem because in a couple days that's happening. That thing you've been waiting for, that thing that makes go and make disciples possible, 
When I told you you would do even greater things than these, that thing that makes that possible, this immersion into my culture, into my presence, will radically transform how you do life. It's coming. And so that's who was waiting. Those people who were faithfully listening to the words of God, waiting in in expectancy for the promise from Jesus. And then in verse 2, we hear suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. It was like... Luke says, it was like this wind entered in. It was so loud. It was like palpable to the readers, the imagery he's using. And then he says in his, in his metaphor, he says it was like a wind entered into the house. It was sounded like a violent wind. What Luke sets us up for in, in his u- word usage is an understanding of what exactly is happening. You see the word in Greek for wind and the word for spirit are the exact same word. It's pneuma. And so there's this spirit, palpable presence, this spirit wind that's entering into the upper room, and it just immerses the believers in the wind of heaven, in the spirit, in the pneuma. It's filling the room. They are drowning in it. It's supposed to be palpable as we read it. It filled the whole house where they were sitting. In verse 3, they saw what seemed then to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. They're like, you know, we don't understand exactly what this is. We don't think it was actually fire, but it definitely looked like fire. And they're remembering in their mind, you know what Jesus said? That he was going to send us the comforter. John the Baptist said that the Messiah is going to baptize in the Holy Spirit and in fire. And now we have the pneuma surrounding us, this wind from heaven, and we have what seems are like tongues of fire resting on each of us. This is the moment Jesus was talking about. This is it. The result of it is all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. Luke, as he's writing this, wants us to know. He's dropping us hints. He says, you know, there was this pneuma that surrounded them. There were tongues of fire, and fire throughout Israel's history has always represented either uh, the judgment of God or the presence of God. It represented his moving among them. The Lord moved and guided Israel by a pillar of fire. He consumed armies in fire. Judgment and wrath came down in fire. The presence of God was oftentimes noted in fire. And now this fire from God is resting on each person, on 120 people, waiting for the pouring out of the Spirit, waiting for this immersion, this baptism, not with water, but with the Spirit and fire. And Luke says, if you're not catching my hints, if you're not stringing the pieces together, let me tell you, they were filled with the Spirit. Make no mistake, this is the Spirit of God at work. Now, what's interesting is as Luke uses this word filled, there's a larger context to the filling. In terms and in regard to being filled, scholar I. Howard Marshall says this. This word, filled, is used when people are given an initial endowment of the Spirit to fit them for God's service, and also when they are inspired to make important utterances. Related words are used to describe the continuous process of being filled with the Spirit or the corresponding state of being full. So when Luke says they were filled with the Spirit, he doesn't say it's just being poured out. And then it's done. This word has the context. It has this richness. It has this depth that when Luke says they're being filled with the Spirit, it's they are filled with the Spirit and continuously being filled and will be filled with the Spirit. 
It is an ongoing filling. It is an ongoing experience and immersion into the family and culture of God, a culture that overwhelms our own culture and propels us to live differently. How much differently? We see it in the rest of verse 4. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now, scholars have gone rounds on what this word tongues really means in this context. What were they doing and what were people hearing? If you continue to read the rest of the story, there was a whole, there was a whole festival, people from all different countries and nations gathered in Jerusalem for this one festival of Pentecost. And as the Spirit fills those 120 faithful followers of Jesus in the upper room, they get up and they speak in tongues. And scholars don't know what to do with it. You know, we see Paul later writing letters to the church, and he explains the gift of tongues a little bit. And he talks about it in terms of tongues of men and angels. And we're like, that's great, Paul, but could you pick one? Because I don't know what to do. I, I just need to understand this because then I'm going to feel like I have a little more control over it. And I just need a little bit of control. If you pick both, I don't know what to do with that. But Paul's like tongues of men and angels. And so while there's a lot of scholarly theories out around what was actually going on at the time, the one that seems to hold the most weight is that they were so filled with the Spirit that they started speaking in the tongues of angels, but the people around them heard them in their own language. It would be really nice and neat if, if God was just endowing them with other languages, right? But why would God just pick one? That would be making him fit into our understanding. Well, Lord, we can only speak one language at the time. He's like, huh, really? <laughs> Check this out. I found a catch-all. And so while we don't know, uh, there, there is a, a theory among scholars that these people spoke in the tongues of angels, but people heard it in the tongues of men. What I find beautiful about this is we talked in Joel 2 about when the Spirit is poured out, it's this liberal pouring out. It's like going to splash everywhere. And so what I think maybe happened, this is opinion. You can argue with me, and I won't argue back because I wasn't there. Okay? Is I think the Spirit gets poured out on those 120, and it splashes on other people. And I think the gift of tongues is given in that moment to 120, and the gift of interpretation is splashed on everybody else. Because as the tongues are going out, and as the Spirit is filling these 120, everybody else is hearing the praises of God uttered in their own language. That's what the gift of tongues was doing, is it started instantly witnessing to the works and wonder of God. Right then, right there, and people were in awe. They were hearing the words of God in their own language. This gives us some understanding, though, about the whole immersion, this whole immersive experience into Acts chapter 2, into Jesus' first baptism. What is the purpose? What is the point? And we said a couple weeks ago that, that Jesus is Emmanuel. He is God with us. But I don't think it was God's only piece of his plan just to be with us. It was also to be in us. To fill us, to overflow, that it splashes over onto other people for a purpose. You see, here's the purpose. Jesus immerses us in his power to act on his behalf. Jesus immerses us in his power to act on his behalf. How do we know that this is it? Because Jesus said, you're going to be empowered to be my witnesses all over the world. And then as soon as it happens, people hear the praises of God uttered in their own language. And what happens just a few verses later, Peter stands up and he gives the very first gospel declaration, the first good news uttered about the person of Jesus and calls people to repent. And over 3,000 people were added to the church that day. The church became. That's what happens when the spirit enters into the mix. That's what happens when we get so filled and continue being filled with the Spirit. Over 3,000 people were added that day from, a, honestly, a very subpar gospel presentation.
That's the purpose of the Spirit. Jesus immerses us in his power so that we can be his witnesses, so that we can act on his behalf. Again, the point of Jesus' ministry was not just to have one Jesus with us, but to multiply himself. He didn't just want one Jesus on the earth. He said, it's better that I go away, because if I go away, then I'm going to send the helper, the advocate. Jesus' goal was to have a thousand plus, hundreds of thousands, millions of little Jesuses walking around the earth and doing even greater things than these. Today, we're going to have an, a chance to respond to this in a different way than we normally do. I'm hoping that as we've built, if you've been with us the last uh, two weeks plus, I'm hoping that there's been a bit of expectation that's built. I'm hoping that there's been a bit of desire. We've been praying that there'd be a bit of desire awakening in our hearts for the outpouring of the Spirit. Because here's, as, as I was prepping again this morning, going over my notes, I felt like the Spirit was saying something to us, not just for this church, not just for the church in Yakima, but for the church in, in America, is this. Is that we've been satisfied with the go and make disciples, and we walked away and we never waited for the empowerment of the Spirit. We've been doing what we knew how to do, and it's only gotten us so far. It's time for us to go back and wait for that outpouring, for that filling, for that empowerment, for the immersive experience that takes us from using a leaf to a stick. As we step into that today, I, just, I want you to be aware of a couple things to set us up in line about the Spirit, about what we call as the baptism of the Spirit. And the first one is that the baptism of the Spirit is the start of the church. Okay, The baptism of the Spirit, it is the start of the church. Before that, there's, there's been a people of God, but there was no gathering around the per person of Jesus. And now we see in Acts chapter 2, at the day of Pentecost, when over 3,000 believers were added to their number, it was the most unintentional and sporadic church plant in history. Also, massive church plant in history. In one day. You see, oftentimes in Scripture... And it goes all the way back to Genesis. A thing is not a thing just because it exists. A thing isn't a thing until it has function. You can see it in Genesis. As things are created, the earth was formless. It wasn't made. And it was void. It didn't have function. And then you track the story of creation and God forms it and gives it function. What is the purpose of humanity? It is to multiply and be fruitful and subdue creation and have dominion. That's our function. You see, a thing isn't a thing until it has function. And now here we see with the, in, uh, with, the, with the outpouring of the Spirit, the indwelling of the Spirit, and the baptism, the immersion into the Spirit of God that we have function. Friends, this is our inheritance. This is not just a, some far-off story. This is our inheritance. This is our genesis. This is our beginning point. This is our origin story. And just like all the Marvel and other superhero moves, it's time for a reboot. It's time for the reboot. It's time for us to grasp that origin story again. So first and foremost, the baptism of the Spirit is the start of the church. Secondly, the bapt baptism of the Spirit empowers the church. Not only do we have a function, but we are empowered to carry out that function, to speak the words of truth and worship. Look at what happens on the day of Pentecost. Look at what happens when Jesus finally baptizes. It's not just one person at a time. It's like, everybody. Right? Splashing out and changing history radically. Not only is there a thing now, but that thing is empowered to do what it's supposed to do. And instantly they start giving thanks and praise to God that people hear in their own language. Again, let's go back to this understanding of an immersive experience. Understanding to grasping language through immersion. What happens when God immerses them into his presence? They learn his language. 
When God baptizes us, we are empowered to speak the language of God. We are empowered to do the things Jesus did. We are able to understand scripture in a way that we didn't before. We are able to grab hold of all sorts of things that we weren't able to grab hold of before. Jesus said you will do even greater things than these. How is that possible? It's not without the Spirit. But again, I do feel like the Spirit is speaking to us that it's time for us to grab hold of this because we have not been operating that way yet. Last week, Monty Wright shared with us an A.W. Tozer quote, and I was quite mad at him. He stole. He stole. Okay? That was mine. I was using it, had it planned. Thankfully, he only shared the first part, so I'm going to share the rest of it because it's worth repeating. But one of our own, again, A.W. Tozer, uh, a Christian and Missionary Alliance, phenomenal leader and pastor, said this about the Holy Spirit and the church. If the Holy Spirit was withdrawn from the church today... 95% of what we do would go on and no one would know the difference. It means our strategies would still be the same. We could still develop mission statements and values. We can set all of those things. We can still do programs. We can still go and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, but we've missed the wait part. 95% of what we do today would go on and no one would know the difference. If the Holy Spirit had been withdrawn from the New Testament church, 95% of what they did would stop and everyone would know the difference. Because you know know what? Being a disciple is not just about not sinning, right? We've, We've spoken about that. Dallas Willard called that the gospel of sin management. We are not here to be managers of sin. We are here to be so filled with the Spirit we don't care about sin. We are supposed to be so filled that if we didn't have the Spirit, 95% of what we do would cease to happen. This is more than just character development. This is as Jesus sends out the 12 and the 72. He says, go and cast out demons, heal the sick, and raise the dead. That's what it means to be a follower of Jesus, absolutely filled and continuing to be filled with his spirit. Unfortunately, we've settled into looking at the brokenness around us and we say, you know what? It's not perfect, but it's ours. I guess we just live with it. Maybe the Lord gave me this. Friends, I'd challenge you. The Lord doesn't give that to anybody. You won't find that in scripture. Amongst the church, the Lord gave this to me as one of the most unbiblical mindsets that we have. You can look, you can challenge me on it, but you won't find it. Because when the Lord gives, when he baptizes, when he immerses us into something, oh, absolutely, it will challenge us. At times, it will even feel like death inside, but when he empowers us, it's to do the things Jesus did, because the Spirit always points to Jesus. It points to our understanding of Jesus, and it points to living like Jesus in us and through us in the world, wherever we go. We have a function. We are the church, and we've been empowered to fulfill that function. That's what Scripture says. It's a radical transformation. And finally, the baptism of the Spirit, it can be received today. The baptism of the Spirit can be received today. No one is cut off from the presence of God. If we've been trying to go this alone, if we've been trying to do things within our own power, we got the commission and we just started doing it and we forgot to go to the upper room with the other 120 believers, the other 120 followers of Jesus to wait for the empowerment, we're not missing out. We're going to get it today. And the only prerequisite to doing that is a confession of Jesus in your life, just saying yes to Jesus. And if you haven't done that yet, I just want to lead you. Just, I want to give you a chance to do that. I want to give you a chance to see 95% of your life just changed. That you don't even know why you just decided to go from using the leaf to using the stick. It can be as simple as this. It's the understanding 
that the world around us and the world in us is broken. It just is. It doesn't take a genius to see that. (laughs) The world around us and the world in us is broken. It's off from the original good intent. There was something that was good that God created, and somehow we've, we've walked away from that goodness, and now it feels a lot like brokenness. And we've tried to fix the brokenness ourselves, and we can't. No amount of try-hard attitude or pull yourselves up by your own bootstraps is going to fix that one. So Jesus, God put on flesh in the person of Jesus, and he came down, and he said, the punishment for their sin, the thing that they're asking for that they don't realize they're asking for, I'm going to take that. And if they say yes to that, if they say yes to the work I've done for them on the cross, because the scripture says that the wages of sin is death, that payment that we should expect for sin, for brokenness in the world and our contribution to it, it's called death. And Jesus takes that on himself. And he brings us into the new family of God. We go from death to life from tomb to resurrection in the person of Jesus, from below the water to above the water. And we enter into the newness, the new life of Jesus, empowered by his spirit and sent out to proclaim the good news. And the only thing we have to do is say yes to that. Not just yes to the forgiveness, but yes to the lordship of Jesus over our lives. It's not enough to believe. Even the demons believe and they tremble. This is not an intellectual capital we're talking about. We're talking about a full surrender. And we don't like the terminology surrender because we're Americans. We're like, we were birthed in rebellion. (laughs) And we're going to be darned if any dictator takes us over. Jesus is not a dictator. You see, when we're willing to submit to him, we aren't ruled over. We're lifted up and out. That thing that we thought we were protecting we actually receive in the person of Jesus when we're willing to lay it down. That's what we get. That's what we get when we say yes to him. We don't have to defend ourselves anymore. We just have to say yes to the one who does defend us. And you can do that in the silence of your own heart this morning. You can say, Lord Jesus, I say yes to you. Not only to your forgiveness for my sins, not only to your sacrifice on the cross on behalf of me, but I give you all that I am and I submit my life to you. I receive you today in Jesus' name. If that's something you can pray for the first time today, we do want to hear from you. We're not going to embarrass you. You can just write it on the card that's under your seat. You can put your name in the connection card. In the comments, you can say, I said yes, and that's all you need to do. You can give it to me. You can put it on a table. You can leave it on your seat and we'll find it. Because we want to help you follow up and take next steps in your journey with Jesus. For some of us, those next steps start today. I'm going to pray in just a second, and the band's going to come up during that prayer. And we're going to worship. And during that worship time, we're going to have two teams. We're going to have a team here in the front, and we're going to have a team in the back. And what we're allowing is we're allowing space in our gathering time for you to respond to what we're talking about today. Maybe you've grown up in the church and you've heard about the baptism of the Spirit. Maybe you have a better articulation of that theology than me. I don't care. That's fine. But have you received it? Have you allowed God's presence to immerse you in his culture? Can you say yes today to a 95% change in your life? That's what we're offering now. So we'll have a team in the front. If you're uncomfortable with coming to the front, you can go to the back. If you don't care, just go to the closest one. All right? So let me pray. Let's prepare our hearts. Ask the Lord, is this your next step?